Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join, uh, join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a challenging and interesting one, a very provocative one on the book of Revelation. So you can guess already, if you know something about the book of Revelation, what kind of a challenge this series is. This particular lesson is lesson number seven for February 16 of 2019 <clears throat> on the seven trumpets. And if there's one part of the book of Revelation that's maybe hardest to interpret, it would be this chapter. So let's see a couple of chapters. Let's, let's see what we can do with it. We need the special help of the Holy Spirit, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that your friend John was exiled on Patmos and struggling, I'm sure, with all kinds of problems, and yet you glorified his life by revealing yourself to him and telling him these stories. We, we have it only in whatever words he could put together. Um, we wish we knew more, but we thank you for what we have and what it reveals to us about the truth. May we come to know you better through this read is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you know, there's a lot of sevens in the book of Revelation. These are the seven trumpets we're going to talk about today in Revelation 8 to 11. And scholars have generally recognized that these are some of the most difficult passages to interpret, not just in the book of Revelation, but in the entire Bible. So we've already noticed that Sevens, we had the seven churches, we had seven seals, and now we're coming to seven trumpets. We're going to go on. There's a number of other sevens. When we suggest that the seven in, in the seven seals, seals we suggested that um, it would cover s some of the similar time period as the seven churches. Now, many people sort of recognize that the seven churches cover a certain time period, and then the seven seals, yeah, we can see maybe that could be spread over the same, same time period. Now, this, we're going to try that with this series again. It's getting more difficult as we go along, but uh, we're going to see if there's a way to try to fit this into different time periods uh, from the time of Christ here on this earth to all, all the way to the second coming. One of the challenges in this lesson is to talk about God's anger or his wrath exercised in some kind of judgments. Does God ever discipline or punish his children? Remember that all of us are his children. There are many, I mean, it doesn't matter where you come from or whatever, whatever your beliefs are, you are still, you know, you may not be one of his faithful children, but you're one of his children. There are many examples throughout the Old Testament and some in the New Testament describing what God has done when he is so-called angry. The most important probably of those examples is Romans 1, verses 18 through 28, actually. Um, and I'm not going to take time to read all of that, but in those, those verses it says, God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. And as we read down carefully, we discover that lo and behold, God gives people up when he's angry. Verse 24, 26, and 28, God just gives them up, that there's nothing more that God can do with them or for them. He weeps as he gives them up. And uh, that's, that's where we are with, in some cases. But we have some very clear words on how he feels when that happens. They're found in Hosea 11. And once again, I wish I could read all eight verses at the beginning of that chapter, but I'm going to read uh, starting with verse 7. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I, as I did Zeboim? And who, what do we know about Adma and Zeboim? Suburbs were destroyed. of Sodom. They were small little towns very close to Sodom. And then goes on, God goes on to say, my heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. So how, I mean, how do you respond to that kind of love? Well, there's a couple of choices. One way is simply to remove his restraint and allow us to reap the natural consequences of our own sinful, sinful behavior. 
And sometimes God does that. He's done it a few times at least. Another way is to remove his protection and allow our enemies to punish us or even conquer us. This happened multiple times to the people in the Old Testament. At the third coming, when the New Jerusalem descends to this earth, God will present his case in review as a grand panorama of the history of the Great Controversy. And those of you who are familiar with Great Controversy, page 666 through 671, you know how it's spelled out there. God will weep as his sinful children perish. And there's some passages like in the story of redemption, page 26, that spell that out. He will then clean up the mess using divine fire to cleanse this earth from disease, sin, sickness, and anything that might pollute in order to remake it like the Garden of Eden. And I'm sure we would all love to be there when that happens. Well, there have been occasions in the past where God has exercised his discipline or punishment on various groups for very different reasons. In Genesis 6 to 8, God sent the flood on this earth to destroy all humanity, except one family because he was about to lose contact completely with the human race. At the end of the plagues on Egypt, the firstborn were killed as a final demonstration of the fact that the God of heaven is superior to all false gods. And just look at that uh, explanation in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. On that night, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Now, how can killing people be a, an exercise in punishing gods? Is that obvious to you? Well, the Egyptians had quite an array of gods. Mm -hmm different times of the year, etc., and different parts of it. But, um, Remember, we had all those. We had the river turned to blood, we yes. had the flies or the gnats, we had the frogs, we had that whole collection of things, and each one of those was some kind of a god for the Egyptians. That's right. And, and those gods, pres presumably, were supposed to protect, most of all, the firstborn. Yes. That was supposed to be their main job, to protect the firstborn. So when nothing else works, even after you've turned the, the, the gods themselves into plagues, you finally attack the firstborn. There were other examples. There were 3,000... Firstborns were kind of gods too, weren't they? Well, in the case of Pharaoh's family, yes. Yeah. The 3,000 that were slain at the foot of Mount Sinai for their idolatrous worship of the golden calf are another example. The slaying of Uzzah, is a, and these things could... We have long discussions about exactly how all these things took place, but it is important to remember that everyone, everyone who perished on any of these occasions has died only of the first death and will arise to face the same judgment that all the rest of us face at the end of this earth's history. Everyone who lived before the flood and all the firstborn who were slain in Egypt will have their cases come up for final review and the pre-advent judgment taking place just uh, well, taking place during the end, time of the end, at, that would be at the third coming of Christ. One interesting feature of God's punishment is mentioned in Ezekiel 9, verse 6. Let's look at that for just a second. Kill the old men, young men, young women, mothers and children, but don't touch anyone who has a mark on his forehead. Start here at my temple. What does that mean? So they began with the leaders who were standing there at the temple. This was a punishment that was meted out to the children of Israel in Jeremiah's day, Ezekiel's day. And what did God say? Well, who were the people who were most informed, who should have been the leaders, who should have been the most carefully following God's ways for their lives? Priests. The priests. And the leaders. I mean, look at, look at the story of Jesus. So, so God says, you people who have the most information, who understand most things, you are the people who I'm going to come to first because you, you've had the most opportunity to make a right decision. The same thing is in Jeremiah 25, 17 to 26. So God's judgments are often, often begin with his own people. And Jesus makes it very clear in several parables that to whom much is given, much is expected. So where does that put us? Well, so are you suggesting that 
they, the pastors and church leaders, might be the first to be judged? Possible. And Sabbath school teachers? And Sabbath school teachers and people like that. But not only that, what about the entire Seventh-day Adventist Church? Don't we have a whole slew of information, inspired records that other groups don't have? And we're responsible for what we have available to us. So now, it might seem like we've wandered away from the trumpets. If the judgments represented by these trumpets are to be poured out, on the earth, we might expect God to begin with punishing or disciplining His own children, especially those who have, had, who have been particularly favored by Him down through the generations. So we're going to just start off by throwing out there some possible suggestions about what these seven trumpets could mean. Fred? Yes, this is uh, suggested by Edwin Thiele. Uh, who outlines the seven trumpets, uh, and this is his suggest suggestion of for how we should understand them. The first trumpet symbolizes the divine judgment that came upon Jerusalem and the Jewish nation when it set itself against Christ and his followers. And we find this in Revelation 8, 7. But then the second symbolizes judgment upon the Western Roman world in Revelation 8, 8, and 9. The third upon the professed Church of Christ when it allowed itself to become defiled and sent forth streams of death rather than life in Revelation 8, 10, and 11. The fourth was the ensuing darkness that came in the Middle Ages Revelation 8.12. The fifth continued, uh, constituted the Mohammedan scourge that swept over the Middle East into Europe, Revelation 8.13, 9 and 12. 9 and uh, 9.12, I'm sorry. The sixth consisted of the scourge that continued under Turkish control of large sections of Asia. Africa and Europe, Revelations 9.13 and 11.14, to 11.14. And the seven, the so seventh trumpet, that is, constitutes the final terrifying outbreak of human passion and hate that characterizes the final period of Earth's history prior to the second coming of Christ, Revelation 11.15 to 19. And this is found in his work, um, titled Outline Studies in Revelation, Anguin, California. Yeah, thank you. One of the interesting things that many Christians don't seem to know anything about, as Protestants primarily, is that as the Protestant Reformation is rising in Europe in the 16th century, and there's this conflict and the Catholic Church is looking for every possible way to crush this new uprising, the king, who should have been leading out in that process, is having to focus on fighting the Muslims who are trying to come in from the East. So, in a sense, the Muslims trying to come in from the East uh, prevented the Catholics from addressing their, their wrath against the, the Protestant uprising, and so Protestants can sort of, in a secondary backhand kind of a way, thank the Muslims for helping them get their start. Well, look at the final end of this. Look at Revelation 6. 15 to 17. Then the kings of the earth, the rulers, and the military chiefs, the rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here, and who can stand against it? That's a pretty frightening prospect, isn't it? Well, in previous lessons, we have learned the fact that the cries of the righteous who have suffered at the hands of the wicked have been a feature of the great controversy from the days of Cain and Abel all the way to the second coming of Christ. So, have you, can you think of any verses we looked at just recently that talk about the cries of the people maybe who have even been killed? Fifth seal. The fifth seal. We, it talks about the souls under the altar and how they are craw crying out. And, and what did God say to Cain way back in Genesis 4? Abel's blood is like doing what? Crying out from the ground. Crying out from the ground. 
So here we have examples of righteous people who have been basically martyred by enemies, and it seems like initially it doesn't seem like God is doing very much about this. I mean, shouldn't God be protecting his people? Well, one possible suggestion is that the trumpets are God's response, or at least his initial response, to the cries of those who are saying, why are you not doing something? Um, look at Revelation 8, 3 to 5 as a clue about that. Another angel who had a gold censer, incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a lot of incense to add to the prayers of all of God's people and to offer it on the gold altar that stands before the throne. Now, the blood that's crying out to be recompensed or to be to being you know being justified where is that located in in the fifth seal under the altar. under the altar under the altar this same altar so this is here it seems like the prayers that are coming up from these what, what I mean, these they're dead but the prayers that came up from these people when things were bad are being joined by this smoke of the burning incense went up from the, with the prayers of God's people from the hands of the angel standing before God. Then the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. There were rumblings and peals of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, that gives us a clue about something. Um, I think, Dennis, you got some information about that? Right. It, uh, this text says, read uh, Revelation 8, 3, and 4, which, which of I course, just you just did, along with the, the description of the daily services in the temple in Jerusalem given below. A Jewish commentary on the Bible explains that at the evening sacrifice, the lamb was placed on the altar of burnt offering, and the blood was poured out at the base of the altar. An appointed priest took the golden censer inside the temple and offered incense on the golden altar in the holy place. When the priest came out, he threw the censer down on the pavement, producing a loud noise. At that point, seven priests blew their trumpets, marking the end of the temple services for that day. Adult hmm. Sabbath School Study Guide for Sunday, February 10. So now, it, we have a little clearer understanding of you know, it looks like God planned the events of the sacred year there in Jerusalem to fit with events he knows are coming in the future among, among his faithful people. Well, uh, the fact that the angel throws down his censer, which the Jews would recognize as a sign of the end of the ceremonies for the day, is a warning to everyone that Christ's intercession, intercession will not last forever. The close of probation is coming. Well, what's, what's with the use of trumpets? What kind of trumpets were these, first of all? Shofar? Yeah, what's a shofar? Ram's, ram's horn. horn. It's a ram's horn that, that the most, the ram's horn is mostly hollow, but you, they usually had to hollow up maybe the last little bit of it, and then they would, they would blow on the short end of it, and then it gets bigger, of course, as it goes close, you know, spins around like that. And, yeah, on the other end, it, it formed a kind of instrument that uh, was used a lot in ancient times by the Jews. And how was it used? What was the shofar used for? Call to war. Mm -hmm. Call to war, for example. And in certain ceremonies at the temple, uh, set numbers 10, 8 to 10, and Second Chronicles 13, 14, and 15. Um, so these, were, these trumpets were, in a way, a way of God sort of carry, giving a message to the, all the people, right? Well, look at Revelation 8, 13. As soon as I can get my cursor to go there. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle that was flying high in the air and saying, saying in a loud voice, Oh, horror, horror, how horrible it will be for all who live on earth when the sound comes from the trumpets that the other three angels must blow. So, trumpets are being used again. And then look at Revelation 9, verse 4. They were told not to harm the grass or the trees or any other plant. They could harm only the people who did not have the mark of God's seal on their foreheads. And then verses 20 and 21, same chapter. 
the rest of humanity, all those who had not been killed by these plagues, did not turn away from what they, had, they themselves had made. They did not stop worshiping demons, nor idols of gold, silver, bronze, and stone, and wood, which cannot see here, um, cannot see, hear, or to walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic, their sexual immorality, or their stealing. So, if uh, the trumpets, like the churches and the seals, cover the course of events from John's time until the end of this earth's history, uh, it is important to notice that intercession is still going on in heaven during that time, and the gospel is being preached on earth. So those are a couple of clues to suggest that this is not something way back in the past, as some would suggest. It's not something way in the future that s some would suggest. Well, let's just look at those verses really quickly. Revelation 8, 3 into 6. Another angel who had a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. We've already looked at this, actually. He was given a lot of incense to add the prayers of all God's people and to offer it on the gold altar that stands before the throne. So these events happen while God's prayers of God's people are still ascending, right? That's one of the clues. And look at the second clue, Revelation uh, 10, 8 to 11, 14. I'm just going to read the first little part of that. Then the voice that I heard speaking from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the open scroll which is in the hand of the angel, standing on the sea and on the land. I went to the angel and asked him if, to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will, be, it will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And we'll talk more about that later. But we clearly believe that that's a part of uh, what happened during the time, a part of human history, right? So in this section on the trumpets, there are many mentions of the figure one-third. What is the meaning of one-third? A lot, but not everything. A lot, but not everything. And look at this. In Revelation 12, which we haven't got to yet, then a great mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a woman whose dress was a sun and who had the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was soon to give birth, and the pains and suffering of childbirth made her cry out. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to earth. Now we know by reading along a little bit further, who is that dragon? Satan. Satan, Satan himself, and he's dealing in what? Thirds. So there's one another clue. We're just we're going to have some simple hints here and there that might help us to interpret these trumpets. Um, so at the end of the trumpets, Revelation 11:15 to 18, we read the seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The power to rule over the world belongs now to our Lord and His Messiah, and He will rule forever and ever." So when is that going to happen? Third coming. At, well, at, you know, even at the coming. second coming, technically. But then the 24 elders who sat on their thrones in front of God threw themselves face downwards and worshiped God, saying, Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, we thank you that you have taken your great power and have begun to rule. So it sounds like the end of these trumpets is at the point where God once again rules on this earth, right? Okay, Gordon. Another possible, this is, this is not significantly different, but this is just from a slightly different perspective. Another way to interpret the trumpets. This is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday. The first two trumpets herald judgments upon the nations that crucified Christ and persecuted the early church, rebellious Jerusalem and the Roman Empire. B, the third and fourth trumpets portray heaven's judgment against the apostasy of the Christian church in the medieval period. C, the fifth and sixth trumpets describe the warring factions in the religious world during the late medieval and post-Reformation periods. These periods are characterized by increasing demonic activity that ultimately draws the world into the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. So, do we believe that we're living in a time of increased demonic activity? No doubt about it. <laughs> no doubt about it? <clears throat> yeah, wow. Well, we know that 
in these groups of seven, between number six and number seven, there's usually an interlude, almost always a, a, some kind of interlude there. And th those interludes are very interesting. They have something to do with, and, and let me just read this one, Revelation 10, starting with verse one. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down out of heaven. So I'm gonna ask you to help me understand who we're talking about in these verses. He was wrapped in a cloud and had a rainbow around his head. His face was like the sun, his legs were like pillars of fire. He had a small scroll open in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Right foot on the sea, left foot on the land. And called out in a loud voice that sounded like the roar of lions. After he had called out, the seven thunders answered with a roar. As soon as they spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice speak from heaven, keep secret what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Then the angel that I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, took a vow in the name of God who lives forever and ever, who created heaven, earth, and the sea, and everything in them. The angel said there will be no more delay. When's that going to happen? The very end. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be at the second coming, right? But when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, then God will accomplish his secret plan as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard speaking from heaven spoke to me again saying, go, take the open scroll which is in the hand of the angel standing on the sea and on the land. I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from his hand, ate it, and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. But after I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, once again, you must proclaim God's message about many nations, races, language, languages, and kings. So we see that at the end of here of the of these um, these trumpets, there's still a time of, of uh, still a time for um, um, the God's message to be proclaimed. Right, Jim? I think you have something about that. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. Setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the dry land shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. Satan, united with evil men, will deceive the whole world and the churches who receive not the love of the truth. But the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and the authority of his voice to those who have united with Satan to oppose the truth. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, in the injunction came to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, Revelation 10:4. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in this order. I'm going to interrupt for a second then there. Are we going to have some kind of a prophet tell us what those future events are? Well, As they will be, be disclosed, what does that mean? That would it will be, be understood. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean a prophet. It means we'll finally get it. Yeah. Perhaps on our own. Yeah, well, that's also possible. But sharing that would be pro being prophetic. You're sharing God's word. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Jim. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in that order. Daniel shall stand up, excuse me, shall stand in his lot at the end of the days John sees and the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relationship to, excuse me, in relation to time. Ellen White's comment comments on in manuscript 59 and it was in 1900 yeah okay. so well the fact that Christ places his foot on the sea and on the land what does that mean to you highly populated areas and sparsely populated areas because of what we have in Revelation 17 5 where it says waters represent what peoples right peoples. so here it sounds like he's shouting out to, to, to worldwide, to de densely populated areas and to sparsely populated areas. In other words, the whole world is yeah, kind of like really. This suggests that his rule is universal. 
He proclaims a worldwide gospel. Well, for some reason, I mean, why does God even mention thunders if he's not going to tell us what they are? Is this just hinting that there's something else going to happen that we will learn about someday? Some, was it, well, that wasn't the time for them to hear it. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. That's true. So this would have been one of those things that it was not the time to reveal that. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Daniel, you know, seal up the book because it wasn't the time. But uh, when you come to the time of the end, then you, you're looking forward to something that God has more to reveal. And we know that even with the little bit of information we do have from these books and Matthew as well and so forth, every few months we hear about somebody predicting the end of the world, you know, interpreting something in some way. <laughs> On the other hand, there's never thunder without lightning first. Yes. Which means the enlightenment comes, and why the thunder? Yeah. And that comes later. Is some may get the, the enlightenment, and others do not, and uh, that causes all the rumbling and grumbling and all the problems yeah. that come along with it. Well, look at these words from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. See if they found, sound at all familiar. One of them asked the angel who is standing further upstream, how will it be until these amazing, how long will it be until these amazing events come to an end? The angel raised both hands toward the sky and made a solemn promise in the name of the eternal God. I heard him say it will be three and a half years when the persecution of God's people ends, all these things will have happened. Does that sound a little bit like the person standing on the land and on the sea? Some of the, he raised his hands in a similar way. Well, um, Daniel mentions specifically a time period of three and one half prophetic years. That also interprets to what other terms? What other time periods? Sometimes it's 42 months and sometimes what? 1260 years. 1260 day years, as we would say. This period of time from 8538 to 1798 outlines the time during which Faithful Christianity was persecuted by the papacy. Now, it's easy to see why we would come up with 1798, but where did the 538 come from? The end of the Ostrogoth Empire. Oh, uh, not kingdom, I should say. Not the okay. Well, it, and that's correct, but uh, what happened that led, led to the end of that kingdom? Well, there were three kingdoms that fell one after the other, and this was the last of the three. Yes. These were, these were Aryan nations, mm -hmm. uh, some of the ten who had attra attacked Rome, and what happened there was that the bishop of Rome uh, had been left more or less in charge of Rome when the, when the Roman Empire officially moved to Constantinople. And on this occasion, and I won't go into all the details, but he took a small group of men out of Rome, it was being surrounded by these Ostrogoths, and this, these, even though they were enormously outnumbered, they managed to wipe out this enormous army, and all of a sudden the Pope said, wow, I don't need the help of the Emperor, I can conquer nations all by myself. And suddenly he had what? He had power. civil and military power supporting Religion. religious ideas. And what do we call that in the Bible? Civil and military power supporting religious beliefs. The uni unity of church and state. Exactly. In, but specifically in the Bible, those are called beasts. The beast. Yeah, when you, when you read about a beast, that's what's happened. I mean, look at Babylon. Babylon is a beast. What was, who, what was uh, Nebuchadnezzar supporting? The worship of Marduk. He, he, the, he, th he tried to force the, the young men who came from Jerusalem to eat these things because they represented the worshiping of Marduk. And you can just go down to each one of those ancient kingdoms and it's, they're, they're trying to support some god that they look up to by the use of force, including the Roman Empire. So um, we know that the longest time period of any prophecy in the Bible is how long? 2300 years, and it says in Daniel 8, 14, I heard that uh, the other angel answer, it will continue for 2300 evenings and mornings during which sacrifice will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. Okay, 2300 days. Well, 
lo and behold, when the Pope was arrested in 1798 and a short time later died in prison, and it looked like, it looked like the power of the Roman Catholic Church was broken, a lot of people started saying, hmm, you know, what's going on here, you know? There have been the massive earth, the Lisbon earthquake, there was the dark day of, of 1780, and now the, the backbone of the Catholic Church appears to be broken, and it wasn't too much longer after that, there was the falling of the stars, and pretty soon people who have any knowledge of the Bible at all are starting to say, hold on here. Moon, dark moon, 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 I mean, darkened sun, moon turned to blood, falling the stars, earthquakes, and all these other things. That sounds like things that were predicted in the Bible, right? Well, a few years later, we came to the ending of Christ's first compartment ministry and the heavenly sanctuary and the beginning of the pre-advent judgment. And I quote now from SDA Bible Commentary, Helen White's comments, the time which the angel declares with a solemn oath is prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971. So, does that give us any indications about whether we should be setting times for the second coming? We should not. We should not be. Absolutely. So we've already talked about the, the, the little book that he was supposed to eat. And what happened when he ate it? Just to review. Sweet as honey, but turned bitter. Sweet as honey in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. And what do we Adventists think that refers to? Book of Daniel. What? Book of Daniel. The Book of Daniel and what, the when the, the eating and the, the, the sweet and the sour, what time? Great disappointment. Great disappointment. The Great Disappointment, which is, remember this huge numbers of people were out and pre be believing, presumably, the idea that Jesus would come again in, in the fall of 1844, and then there was that crushing defeat when he didn't show up, and uh, very sour, very bitter, known as the Great Disappointment. Well, then we come to Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. Look at those verses. I was then given a stick that looked like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count those who are worshiping in the temple. Okay? What does that, what does that suggest to you? When you start measuring things, what does that mean? Judging. Often suggests some kind of judgment, doesn't it? There are many similarities between these measurements of the temple, the altar, and the worshipers of the events on the, to the events of the Day of Atonement. Um, um, I think we have time just to read another two, three verses. Look at Leviticus 16. The Day of Atonement is described in Leviticus 16. I'm going to read from verses 16 to 19. In this way, he will perform the ritual to, to purify the most holy place from the uncleanness of the people of Israel and from all their sins. You remember that in type, the children of Israel would come to the, to the gateway of the, of, the, of the tabernacle there. They would confess their sins over the lamb. The lamb, lamb would be slain. The blood would be carried, a small part of it would be carried into the temple, thrown at the foot of the altar there, suggesting the idea that their sins were being carried into the temple. Then on the Day of Atonement, remember that they went through an elaborate ceremony, and the high priest would go in finally into the Most Holy Place, he would collect those sins in figure, and he would carry them out and place them hands, his hands on a scapegoat. And at least in type, these sins would be transferred to the scapegoat, and the scapegoat would be led by someone way out into the de desert where it would be left to be probably eaten by wild animals. So from the time Aaron enters the most holy place to perform the ritual of purification until he comes out, there must be no one in the tent. When he has performed the ritual for himself, his family, and the whole community, he must then go out to the altar for burnt offering and purify it. He must take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it all over the projections at the corners of the altar. With his finger, he must sprinkle some of the blood on the altar seven times. And this way, he is to purify it from the sins of the people of Israel and make it holy. 
So what's being purified there? Altar. The altar and the tabernacle in, in symbol, right? Mm -hmm. So, and what do we believe that refers to? The earth. The earth, and what's happening to the earth? Judgment. Judgment, okay. And we've already suggested that the judgment begins with whom? Also the Lord. Those who are on the Lord's side and from the ancient days, so the ancients at the temple like that and down through time. And so we believe that the time is, is God is gradually progressing, reviewing the names of everybody who has ever lived on this earth and finding out which ones are safe to admit to heaven and which ones are not safe to admit to heaven. That's the bottom line. Is it safe to have these people live next door to you for the rest of eternity? Then we see Th two... This is two yeah. because God's memory is defective? No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with God's memory. He's opened the, opening the books of heaven and making it apparent, because we read this already back in chapter 4, who's watching everything he does? Really? Four living creatures, 24 elders, 100 million angels are watching everything God does. And you can read about that judgment in Zechariah chapter uh, 3, uh, 1 to 5, and then some on verse 10 as well. And Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, exactly. So suddenly we see two witnesses dressed in sackcloth. Where did those people come from? Or are they people? Well, they're described as trees and lamps. They just seem to have plenty of power and even the ability to destroy their enemies and strike the earth with every kind of plague. So if that were the case, well, shouldn't they be able to just stop anyone who has any tries to come against them? You would think so, right? But what happens? They're killed. They're killed by someone who comes from where? You remember? I'm asking you to answer a lot of questions here. Mm -hmm. look, at, look at Revelation 11, verses 7 through 13. When they finish proclaiming their message, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will fight against them. He will defeat them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city where the Lord was crucified. The symbolic name of that city is Sodom or Egypt. People from all nations, tribes, and languages, and races will look at their bodies for three and a half days and will not allow them to be buried. The people of the earth will be happy because of the death of these two. They will celebrate and send presents to each other because those two prophets brought much suffering upon the earth. After three and a half days, suddenly, a life-giving breath came from God and entered into them, and they stood up, and all who saw them were terrified. Then the two prophets heard a loud voice say to them from heaven, Come up here. As their enemies watched, they went up into the heaven in a cloud. So, who do we think these things refer to? Old and New Testament. The, the best witnesses that we can find that seem to fit that description are the two parts of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And who is it that comes out of the abyss? Uh, the dra well, the Satan. Yeah. Satan, yeah. The beast that's, that comes out of the... Yeah, so and he's, Satan. he's. I mean, that's his habitat, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it has been strongly suggested by many scholars, not just from our church, but from others, that this refers to the atheistic attacks on the Bible and the abolition of the religion in connection with the events of the French Revolution. Do you remember what Voltaire said about the Bible in those days? A number of things, but... Basically that it would disappear. Yeah, he said, in a short time, nobody will care about anything that's written in the Bible anymore. The moral atmosphere in Paris in those days the, was like that of Sodom, the atheistic arrogance like that of Egypt, and the rebelliousness like that of Jerusalem. Well, fortunately for us, what happened next? Reformation. Those, yeah, those two things came alive again. And what does that represent in terms of history? Do you remember? The, the translation of the Bible. And, yeah. And so how did that happen? Remember that 
we're talking about the French Revolution happened what years? 1798. 17, well, 1789 to about up there, and then finally the Pope was taken captive in 1798. The British and Foreign Bible Society and other Bible societies suddenly started work, and they said, look, we're supposed to be spreading the gospel to the whole world. Major, major groups of people in other parts of the world don't even have the Bible translated into their languages. So they got people and they started translating, and when they would translate them, they would print these books and they would carry them out to other parts of the world, and suddenly the Bible has come back alive, right? There's something very important to us as Adventists that happened at that point in time. We mentioned earlier in our, one of our Sabbath school discussions, do you remember what it was? What did the British and Foreign Bible Society do? This is a, this is a, a you want A in the, the class, what? Translated the Bible into modern language. Yes, they did. They translated the Bibles into modern language. They did something else. They decided that it wasn't worth printing the Apocrypha. Yeah. So they left it out of the Bible, and they started printing the 66 books of the Bible, which Protestants now recognize as our Bible. They started printing those Bibles, Bibles with those things, and, and, and the ones they translated into all these other languages had only those 66 books in them. So we know that there will be one final glorious proclamation of the gospel in connection with the latter reign as described in Revelation 18, 1 to 4. Satan will not be sleeping. He and his hordes of evil angels will be spreading the deceptions like unclean, unclean spirits described in Revelation 16, 13 to 16. And in case you haven't guessed by now, these last parts of Revelation are interrelated. We, this one jumps to there, and that one jumps to here, and so forth. So we're going to see these things. We're going to see things when we get to the plagues. We're going to see talking about things that sound like the trumpets and, and so forth. So we're just seeing some of that here. There will be a time for God's faithful people who will be tried to their uttermost and when, and when if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. And where do we read about that? Matthew, Matthew 24, 24, verse 24. After all these terrible events portrayed in the seven trumpets, we come to a time when God again takes control of the events, even here on planet Earth. Now, when was the great controversy won? At the cross. cross. At the cross. So certainly, if you want to stretch out a little bit, by the resurrection. Yeah. So, the, so why has he waited for 2,000 years? Paul talked about the falling away must come first, so there must have been some, some, some reason why that had to take place. And who has claimed to be the ruler of this earth for all that time? Satan. Absolutely. We read about the seven last, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the eight, three angels' messages in Revelation uh, 14, 9, well, actually, this is... Um, I'm sorry, this is Revelation 12, 9 to 12. Let me just read these words about Satan. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Then he heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority for the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you who, that live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. What do we call people who know that there's only a short time left? Short timers. <laughs> Adventists. Adventists. Yeah. Ooh. The devil is an Adventist. Not an Adventist of the big A, but Adventist of the little A. Well, it has been suggested that the seventh trumpet, seventh trumpet, I'm sorry, outlines the content of the remainder of the book of Revelation. Just briefly touching on the nations are angry, Revelation 12 to 14, uh, and especially Revelation 12, 17. Satan with his two allies, the sea beast and the earth beast, prepare for an all-out final battle against God's people. Two, God's response is the seven last plagues when he withdraws his restraining powers from this earth and allows Satan to take almost complete control of this earth. 
This time is referred to as God's wrath. So let's be just clear. What, what, what's going to happen describes this as a time of God's wrath? Is God going to be coming down there and mad as hops and doing what he, has, what he wants to do? Is, uh, the, well, the winds of strife are released. He's going to uh, remove his, his restraining power. He withdraws power. his restraining powers from this earth and allows Satan to take almost complete control. Satan has said from the beginning of the rebellion in heaven, if you just le let me be in control, things would be so much better. So finally God will say, well, for a little while we'll let you have almost complete control. You know, if we've had a lot of down through history. Yeah, exactly. We underestimate perhaps how much influence he has. And then there will be the time for the dead to be judged, Revelation 20, 11 to 15. The reward of God's people is finally shown, Revelation 21 and 22. God destroys those who destroy the earth, Revelation 19, 2. Shows that the end time Babylon is judged because it destroyed the earth. How, how does that work? Our, how does Babylon destroy the earth? Fighting amongst themselves, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and and the, the spirit of Babylon is destructive. Yeah, yeah. confusion, <laughs> false yeah. concepts of God, yeah. which is ultimately destructive. Mm -hmm. Well, the final act in the great controversy will be when God at the third coming shows that panorama in the skies. Everyone, both the wicked and the righteous, realize that there is nothing more that God could have done to save anybody. The destruction of the wicked, including Satan, will be the result. Revelation 19 spells out in some detail how the judgments will take place. Um, so, we've said Revelation 8, 2 through 11, 18 are the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets talk about God's dealing with his children who belong to other religious movements. Between the sixth and the seventh trumpet is that interlude from Revelation 10, 1 to 11, 14 that gives a brief description of the challenges God's faithful people will face. As we have suggested, the seven trumpets seem to be an answer to the prayers of the saints that, uh, in the fifth seal. It will be judgments on those who have persecuted Christians and thus probably affects primarily the opponents of God's people throughout Christian history. So we have attempted to try to pick up a few hints here and there that let us nail down what these seven trumpets might refer to. And Jim, I think you have, uh, no, it's not Jim, it's uh, I, Fred. Yes, I, we're talking about um, <coughs> the meaning of the ima imagery in the first six trumpets, mm -hmm. which is interesting. The first trumpet uses the Old Testament language of God's judgment, uh, hail, fire, and blood, Exodus 9, 23, 26, uh, Isaiah 10, 16 to 20, Ezekiel 38, 22, directed against symbols of God's Old Testament people, vegetation and trees, Psalm 1, 1 to 3, and Isaiah 61, 3. Hence comes the lesson suggested by the first trumpet that represents God's judgment on the, on the Jerusalem that, has, that had rejected Christ, Matthew 23, 37 uh, and 38, Luke 23, 28 to 31. And this comes from the adult teacher's Sabbath school lesson. Then you're going to read us number two there? Well, the, the second trumpet recalls, uh, in general, God's judgment against those who persecuted his people in the early centuries of the Christian era. Okay, Dennis, we need to move on fairly quickly. The symbolism of the third trumpet parallels biblical imagery for the work of Satan. Isaiah 14, 12 to 19, Luke 10, 18, and Revelation 12, 9. But the symbolism of lamp, springs, rivers, and water suggests spiritual growth in life. Psalms 1, 3, Psalms 84, 6, and 7, Psalms 119, 05, Jeremiah 2, 13. The falling of the stars and the embittering of the, embittering of the waters connect the two ideas, suggesting a perversion of truth and a rise of apostasy. The lesson, therefore, associates this trumpet with the condition of the church in the Middle Ages. 
In the fourth trumpet, the sources of light, sun, moon, and stars are darkened. The symbols of truth are partially, partially eclipsed. This darkening could represent the deepening of apostasy, apostasy in the church. Uh, and those are found in Exodus, Job, Isaiah, John, and uh, a couple places in John. Gordon? With the fifth trumpet, the partial darkness of the fourth becomes total and worldwide, Revelation 9, 1 and 2. This represents the triumph of religious apostasy and secularism in the modern age. With God and truth totally eclipsed, sinful humankind is left to the demonic torment of destructive desires in Revelation and Luke. The only safety is in a genuine relationship with God, Revelation and Ephesians. So what about that interlude? That interlude talks about God's faithful people, the ones who remain loyal and how they will be treated and we'll get into more details about that as in, in later lessons. So it might not be easy to see how all this fits together. We've given some possible suggestions that I hope you'll think about. We have one more comment about all of this. Jim? The judgments of the first two trumpets fall on those powers that combined to crucify Jesus. The religious authorities of Jerusalem under Caiaphas and the Roman civil authority under Pilate. What does this fact tell us about opposition to the gospel? Opposition to the gospel tends to come in two distinct forms, opposition from inside the church and from outside the church. Jesus was crucified, then the le leaders of Israel inside combined with the forces the outside forces, which is Rome, the, op the greatest opposition often comes from those who profess the same faith but are really wolves in sheep's clothing. So in this lesson, we have covered a great amount of material and we've made some suggestions about how these things might play themselves out. If you'd like to look at all these references, we went through them very quickly. You're more than welcome to go to our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get our hand out there. It takes some work, but you can see if you go over these things carefully and you can recognize how many references there are to the Old Testament, you can see how someone who was very familiar with the Old Testament would start seeing a picture developing that will help us to focus our attentions as we work our way through the rest of the book of Revelation. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we've had of studying this material, even though it's challenging and sometimes it's not always completely clear. We know that this section of Revelation is particularly difficult to interpret and to fit everything together, but we thank you for this opportunity we've had to look at some possible suggestions. Give us clear minds as we think about them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.